Is there a link between the terrible power of earthquake and lights in the sky? As in Japan, beneath this Californian valley, tectonic plates forming the skin of the earth meet and fret in slow collision. The San Andreas Fault. Across the fault line, the far side of the valley grinds north to Alaska at two centimeters a year. When the plates stick and then suddenly give, you get an earthquake. And one day, it'll be the big one. Against that day, the United States Geology Survey has built a spider's web of monitoring stations along the taut fault lines of America. From inside the wound in the earth itself, sensitive probes constantly take the pulse of the fault. If the big one comes, when it comes, the first sign will come from here. Every second, data streams back to the central computers of the geology survey, a running medical history of the Earth's seismological blood pressure. When Michael Persinger compared this data with reports of lights, he made a remarkable discovery. Initially, when we looked at all of the data, we realized that luminous events were one of the most frequent, unusual uh, reports of the previous centuries. And when we completed the computer analysis, basically nature told us, that is the empirical approach, the induction approach, told us that luminous events occurred during the times of earthquakes. And furthermore, luminous events tend to occur before earthquakes. So we began to pursue that one major thrust, which was that there appeared to be a temporal and spatial relationship between an increase in luminous events, which some people called UFOs or odd luminosities or demons or airships, depending upon the culture, and the later occurrence of earthquakes. Persinger's computers can show the incidence of lights over time in specific regions and link lights with seismic activity. We have displays of New Mexico and Colorado, luminous displays throughout July 1947. We see the strain building up. Earthquake will be right in here. There's more strain. Earthquake, there it is. In the early 1980s, UFOs were reported at Yakima, an Indian reservation in the American Northwest. Some people got stuck over here to our, to our north and we called about three other officers to come help us, and we saw two cars coming down the road. And they stopped, and I said, look, there's two cars coming. And then after they agreed, looked at them to see who, who could be, then they just shot out. They just turned, faced their lights, faced the south, and went right over this ridge. And we thought, well, that's no cars. Oh, I have seen just plain these big orange lights that remind you like the full moon, orange full moon when it comes up. And then I've seen just little lights, uh, maybe a little white light. I've seen bouncing lights. Each mystery light was reported from Toppenish Ridge. They were recorded by the fire wardens who stand sentinel scanning the area for brush fires. These solid accounts made the UFO stories worth investigating. The UFO is unidentified flying object and unidentified means unidentified. It doesn't mean that the things are extraterrestrial or they're terrestrial, they're simply unknown. And it's interesting that probably 10% of all the UFO reports are what you would call genuine UFOs because um, these are things that truly can't be identified by mundane uh, causes. 
The study, initial study, lasted about two weeks, and I went from field to field and lookout to lookout. Uh, the fire lookouts were very uh, important in, in helping. I can't say I was ever scared. I was kind of concerned at one time because I was looking at some lights on a ridge and happened to look up to my left and see this thing hanging under the clouds, another dirty yellow light, and uh, that, that shook me up a little bit. Toppenish Ridge stands in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. Could the Cascades contain another clue to confirm Persinger's hypothesis of a link between the lights and earthquake? John Durr, one of the Geology Survey's leading geophysicists, set off for the Cascades to explore the theory further. The Cascades are a chain of volcanoes on the eastern edge of what is tectonically called the Cascadia subduction zone. That's an area where a tectonic plate in the Pacific Ocean is pushing itself underneath the continental United States, causing some uplift and also producing the heat that generates the magma that comes out in these volcanoes. So the Cascade region is generally active. But why specific light activity at Toppenish Ridge? John Durr sought out a local geologist for the answer. Ted Rapaski has mapped every inch of the ridge. Right here, this is, it's an obvious fault scarp going through. This section has been dropped down, and they call that a, a grobin, where it drops into the, in, down. But generally, Toppenish Ridge has a series of thrust faults where the front of the ridge has been Thrust, thrust forward, I see. and if you look up on the ridge, you can see a, f a few other horizontal trends or lines through there, and those are also some fault features where it's been thrust and offset. And it was along these very thrust faults that the Toppenish lights had danced. Every few years, there's at least some little earthquake in an area like this and every 100 or 200 years there can be a very strong earthquake and a lot of motion. So in a geologic time frame, that's pretty much constant motion. The rocks, while they're under all of this stress, are cracking and breaking, and, and this is what leads up to all of the earthquakes and all of these strange phenomena that accompany them. Toppenish is the birthplace of the mother of all UFOs. In the 1940s, a sighting from the air actually gave the phenomenon its name. Back in 1947, Kenneth Arnold was flying a light plane along the Cascades when he saw a series of lights skipping along the crest of the mountains. And he, the way he described them was, was actually the origin of the term flying saucer. He radioed ahead that they appeared to be close to the mountaintops and traveling at tremendous speed. When Arnold came in for a landing at Pendleton, airport personnel and the local press were waiting for him. When people give flying saucer reports or UFO reports, there's probably a thousand and one reasons for that report which would range from misidentification of Venus or the moon with a cloud passing over it uh, to somebody in a very distraught mental condition to somebody outright lying or hoaxing. He saw what? So you always have to distinguish between the reports and what the actual phenomenon was that triggered that report. In the next 24 hours, virtually every newspaper in the country ran the story. But was the explanation to be found in space or below the Earth? John Durr found the answer to Arnold's sightings in the files of the area's seismic records. When I looked at the data, I was surprised to see that it was about two years before the largest earthquake to occur in the state of Washington that was ever recorded instrumentally. 
given the size of that earthquake and the lead time for earthquake precursors, it's not at all strange to me that what he saw could very well have been earthquake lights associated with some initial strain that led up to this big earthquake. The empirical analysis that we've completed indicate that most luminous events that people call UFO reports are coupled to earthquake activity, that they're natural phenomena, and both these balls of light, no matter how unusual they may be, and earthquakes have one thing in common, tectonic strain, not extraterrestrial forces. But what is the link between lights in the sky and rocks under stress? At University College in London, experts crack rocks like a scientific convict gang. OK, we've got a, a sandstone specimen, which we're going to break in impression by using this. Paul Devereux realized that this research could yield evidence about what he calls earth lights. A sandstone core will be compressed, squeezed until it shatters. All its vital signs will be monitored. Any energy produced, sound waves, electromagnetism, will be recorded. As we're getting close to the failure of the rock, we've got more and more cracking occurring, generating these acoustic emissions, which are now coming in uh, quite fast. You can see the, the load increasing in a compressive sense and the uh, rock deforming in a compressive sense. I, I'm, I know how we regard rock fracture is that you get a, a lot of cracking activity, but that increases in intensity and actually localizes to form what, what becomes a fault in the rock. OK, so, so the rock is about to fail, and we've got the electromagnetic emissions oh, yes. coming in now yeah. and the acoustic emissions piling in. Uh -huh. It's about to go any moment. Oh, yes. In thousands. So this sudden sort of drop off like a cliff face here is when the, uh, the core actually failed, it actually uh, imploded. That, that's the catastrophic failure, yeah. The, the peak stress is somewhere Before back that, here, yeah. and then the, uh, the rock is what we call strain softening, right. and the actual catastrophic failure is sometime after peak stress. That's really the end of the process. That, that's, 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 yeah, that's, that's when it went bang and made us jump. So we can see here with this uh, yellow graph here that there was um, electromagnetic emission after that peak moment then. There seem to be these spikes coming out. That, that's right. So we've got some uh, precursory electromagnetic emissions right. which are Those occurring. Spikes. That's yeah. right. They, they're occurring after peak stress. But, and then just as the uh, rock fails, we, we get um, some massive electromagnetic right. emissions here. This rock core only produces millivolts, not enough to spark a light bulb. But imagine it scaled up to the dimensions of a mountain. Theoretically, a multi-megawatt explosion. But scientists still don't know how the energy is released into the atmosphere. Back among the high lakes of the Cascades, John Durr believes that water may have a part to play. Dams on the rivers of the Cascade Mountains force water into the surrounding rock. Could this energy be the source of the Toppenish lights? If you push water into a crack, uh, the water can, can break up into small droplets under, under the high pressure. And whenever you separate a stream of water into smaller water droplets, you're, you're separating charge so that each of the water droplets carries a packet of charge with it. This might be able to build up and cause something similar to a lightning strike, only the charge is built up in the earth. But surely the rock, being a good conductor, would earth the charge and stop it flashing to the sky. The main problem is that in order to get uh, uh, this charge to cause the lights, uh, you have to have charge uh, generated and maintained for uh, how long the lights last. And the earth is a good conductor 
And so it's difficult to see how you could maintain that charge for very long. Biolis theory involves both heat and water. Earthquakes produce heat. A sheath of steam coats the edges of the fault, but water vapor is a bad conductor. The effect is to insulate the edges of the fault with a non-conductive layer. From below, a colossal charge builds up and could burst into the air in the form of light. So uh, during the earthquake, you have a vaporized region uh, that is, can be fairly wide and uh, depend on the magnitude of the earthquake, of course. So that is an insulator. But the central region, uh, right at the, where the slip is occurring, is a conductor. So the charges can be uh, generated and concentrated onto that central conductor, and which is separated from the rest of the, of the conductive uh, rock outside the fault zone.